right, welcome to Afterthoughts, everybody. This is the Recommend or Refute episode for this week. Uh, I am your host, John Garcia. Joining me at the table is Ryan King. Hey, how's it going, John? It's going pretty good, my friend. We've got, we got a good lineup, I believe. Uh, also joining us is... Remains to be seen. Michael Dixon. It does remain to be seen <laughs> by you, the listener, <laughs> but has most of them have been seen by us. But yeah, uh, Michael Dixon is joining us at the table. I am. I'm here. Uh, excited to hear what you guys watched this week and uh, get into it. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, let's dive right in. Ryan, I believe uh, you are kicking us off. What you got for let's us? Kick us off. Uh, I have recommends, though. We need to get some refutes in here. I feel like we've been on a recommend. No, I'm on the, I'm on the way. Look. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll recommend. Uh, yeah. So since we have recently watched Dirty Harry, uh, Adarla had made a comment about how Clint Eastwood just plays the same guy over and over again. Uh, I was itching yep. for a, a slightly <laughs> off. Yeah. One, That's one a of bad few, thing. <laughs> no, no. He knows, he knows what he's, you know, he knows. He's what so he's good at with. that thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was, I was itching for an, for an off type Clint Eastwood movie. And they're like four. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, but at the same time, when, when I was thinking through them, cause I had mentioned to Darla, uh, play Misty for me came to my mind. For Clint Eastwood, an invitation to terror. You ever find yourself being completely smothered by somebody? There's no escape in passion. There's no escape in speed. There's no escape from terror. Because it also came out in 1971, uh, and it's Clint Eastwood's directorial debut. So I kind of was like, all right, I got, a f- I got a few interesting things to watch it for. I vaguely remember watching this a long time ago. Um, again, same. Yeah, I kind of had just watched a bunch of Clint Eastwood movies all the same time. Uh, I was deciding between this and Every Which Way but, but Loose, but I have watched that one <laughs> uh, multiple times. That movie is wild. Uh, and that movie's crazy. Um, <laughs> the plot the basic plot of play missy for me is that clint eastwood is a overnight radio dj in uh carmel by the sea before he's the mayor this is just when he thought it was a cool place to hang out um (laughs) but he knew he could use the location because this is another we use this location for every last piece that we can you see a lot of the town and some of monterey as well uh he gets a call almost every night from a female listener who wants to hear the song Misty uh, and will say, play Misty for me. And eventually she runs into him, quote, runs into him at a bar. Uh, but more or less, she's been waiting there knowing that it's a bar he frequents. Uh, and they have one night, but then, you know, kind of supposed to be no strings attached. But immediately, uh, she attaches strings like crazy. And this then essentially is just a thriller uh, movie where right away you can start to see that she thinks a whole lot more of this relationship and slowly is more and more unhinged as things go on. Uh, and it gets pretty tense. She is played by Jessica Walter. Hell yeah, uh, she is. The, the late <laughs> Jessica Walter, who, uh, yeah, most people know is now a TV mom as um, Mallory Archer in Archer. ISIS isn't your own personal travel agency. It doesn't exist just so you can jet off to Whore Island. That's not a real place. And Lucille Bluth. Yeah, Lucille Bluth in Arrested Development. I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? I didn't realize she was the mom in the Dinosaurs TV show. What? Oh, I didn't know that either. Please, please. Mommy needs some sleep. I haven't had any sleep since the night you were hatched. I love being up with the mama. Yeah, she was also the mom in that. Uh, But this is, you know, an earlier role for her. This is the first nomination that she gets. She's actually Golden Globe nominated for this role. And she is excellent. Like, she does an excellent job of going back and forth between trying to seem calm and demure and in love and, and then to immediately snap and then immediately go back. Uh, and yeah, she, she comes off very creepy and, and honestly scary, um, and, an excellent job. 
Uh, Clint Eastwood, eh, from a directing standpoint, he, he, this is a good example of how he just copped a lot of stuff from Don Siegel at the time. It feels very similar in style. Some kind of similar shots, sort of loose and using the locations a lot. The action sometimes is kind of a lazy psycho, I would say. Like when it kind of gets to that point, there's some sort of jump scare type stuff that doesn't come off. It it works, but it it also I'm kind of like, all right, we you know we get it. This movie is definitely kind of like by the book, uh, straightforward. You you generally kind of know where things are going, but it's still very tense. Like he does a good job of making it tense, and Jessica Walter I think just really carries it through excellently. Eastwood does his job, but I, there were a lot of times I kind of noticed I was like he kind of is like a dick to people around him, and particularly the cops that are trying to help him out and uh, a few of the other people in his life where it's one of those, like if you just said like two or three more things instead of just being an asshole, like we probably could resolve this a little bit easier or sooner. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is his kind of usual, like somewhat quiet Clint Eastwood, but he's not a badass in this case. He's just a, a, just a DJ. DJ who likes jazz music, I guess. He's like, you yeah. want me to play Misty for you, punk? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, it hurts from a pacing standpoint way worse than Dirty Harry. Any complaint I had about Dirty Harry, this one really hurts from a pacing standpoint. It's pretty slow. There's some moments of like real tenseness and action, and then it stops and does a shoot the rodeo where yeah. they actually go to the Monterey Jazz Festival for like way too long. <laughs> and just like shots of the crowd and Clint Eastwood in the crowd. And then there's like one whole song essentially that gets played at the festival. Uh, and I was kind of like, okay, this is after we have seen uh, Evelyn, uh, Jason, Jessica Walters' character, almost kill someone. We need to stop and take a break <laughs> for part of the movie. Uh, kind of a weird spot. Let's get um, some cool jazz into this yeah, thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, all you boppers. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it does use music. It tries to, to, there isn't any like score to it other than these for the most part diegetic songs either from the radio or played over there's one kind of elongated 70s uh having sex everywhere possible scenes that has music <laughs> over the top of it that's not diegetic but otherwise it's it's kind of that but it is using modern music misty uh hit the the top of the charts around that same time so it, i recommend it because it's an interesting watch for a different Eastwood movie and really Jessica Walter is really awesome and really makes it and that will carry you through the movie um maybe in the top half it's probably in the top half of Eastwood movies there's a lot of really shitty ones like the rest of the Dirty Harry movies honestly <laughs> <laughs> get really bad really fast um of the not you know classical Eastwood it's there's still several more that are better than this uh, jury's out on every which way but loose. <laughs> on if that's better or worse, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, when I I saw this in, I believe it was in my fifth year of college, and I was getting my master's degree, and like all of my friends had already graduated and and left, and I was really into Eastwood, and I had bought this like 40 DVD box set of Clint Eastwood movies, and I was just running through them and watching like all of these obscure Eastwood movies and. This was one of them. Um, you talk about like, you know, kind of not Western, not action Eastwood movies. Like there's this, there's the Beguiled, there's Honky Tonk Man where he plays a country <laughs> singer. Uh, Pink Cadillac is a super weird one. There's like, you know, these, these ones kind of that have kind of been forgotten that are these odd movies that it feels like Eastwood trying to kind of break out of his, um, you know, how he's been stereotyped and to do something different um he is very into music like he has a country album at least oh, one yeah. i think um yeah didn't he do a musical i uh, paint, well, your wagon? paint your wagon oh yeah, 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 yeah. i have the, so he uh, did paint your wagon for right I haven't, before this is one of the few ones yeah. i haven't seen actually oh of, my gosh of his movies. yeah you don't want to hear him and lee marvin sing it's amazing <laughs> oh yeah i kind of do uh, i've got it on record <laughs> i mean we can just jam out to it anytime i've never seen the movie <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dad, listen uh simpsons also parodied that that's right they did <laughs> uh but yeah the, really the main thing i remember is that jessica walter was freaking creepy in it and other than that i remember that being like oh that was okay that was kind of weird not really sure what eastwood was going for there like 
let's get to the next one. Let's move on to the next Eastwood movie in the in the collection. Um, so yeah, I remember it being okay, but Jessica Walter was definitely what stood out. I still remember that performance for sure. Yeah, I, it's on it. Like Basic Instinct is better. Like if you want to see <laughs> this, I think before Basic Instinct, this was probably it. Um, for you know to do it, but honestly, like Basic Instinct does kind of exactly the same thing, but better. Um, but it's still it's still good. It's still interesting. It's still good. Yeah. So pretty much, this is absolutely seventy one. Is like. Clint Eastwood being like, all right, I'm done. Let's do something different. Mm-hmm. Um, Paint Your Wagon nearly was his last Western. Uh, and it's very <laughs> off type because it's just a musical. Um, but then, yeah, to have The Beguiled, to have Play Misty for Me and have Dirty Harry all in the same year. Uh, very, very much like, a, all right, what can I do that's different? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do something completely different. Uh, Don yeah. Siegel is in this. Uh, this is this is of those three in 71. The only one that's not Don Siegel directed. Uh, he's a bartender just as like a you know, a one-off cameo bit. <laughs> and the marquee in Dirty Harry, at one point he goes past, has play Misty <laughs> for ah. me as the movie that's showing in the, oh. in the I think before the I think before the gun shootout uh, at the bank. So. Very incestuous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> does does Eastwood in this movie um have have to have like a high energy DJ position. Like, has he got a personality nope. like that, or is it no? Okay. Uh, he's like late night he's the, jazz. He's DJ. the overnight oh, chill. Okay, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. He yeah, reads I a poem before oh. he starts his show. He reads a little poem to get you into the mood. <laughs> oh yeah. damn. Okay. Then That's play interesting. Some overnight jazz. This one I, goes out to my lovers. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear Eastwood attempting a America's Top Forty style <laughs> energy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Soundboard, but yeah, flushing yeah, out noises and stuff. You're listening to Dirty Harry in the Morning Crew. <laughs> <laughs> Get a man on the street. But it's just it's my 44 Magnum. <laughs> it's just the sound of screaming. The traffic on 35 <laughs> is terrible this morning. We recommend you. Pull out your 44 Magnums and do what you need to do to get to work on time. <laughs> the more pedestrians you hit, the more points you earn. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's Death Race 2000. That's oh, a yeah. Sorry. Sorry. That's a different movie. <laughs> that's Stallone. So is, that still, oh, I thought, is that Statham too, or is it just Stallone? No, this oh. is very early in Stallone's uh, career. It's pre-Rocky Stallone. I see. I see. One of the Carradines. I always forget which. I can't. You know, the Carradines all look the same. Yeah. Yeah. But only one of them died a certain way. <laughs> so I <don't> know. <laughs> was a show. Uh, I knew we were going for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shit. <laughs> as soon as the care needs are mentioned, which somebody's going to say it. Uh, <laughs> well, cool. So you would recommend that, Ryan? Um, yeah, I would recommend it. Awesome. Uh, Dixon, what do you got for us? Cool. Yeah. So I um, actually reached out to John um, a few days ago and I was like, hey, uh, Solaris is playing this Friday. Do you want to go? And you were like, I'm really tired and I don't know that I can deal with Sir Tarkovsky's slow pacing right now. Yeah. So <laughs> I went by myself and watched uh, Andre Tarkovsky's Solaris. The scene is somewhere in the cosmos. The time, the distant future. The place, a planet yet unknown to us. Based on the novel by Stanislav Lem. Chris, I'm not Carrie. I don't care. <laughs> Carrie doesn't exist. She is dead. Accept it, Kelvin, or you are lost. Let us take you with us to Solaris, planet of mystery, embodiment of man's latent conflict with the unknown. Man, face to face with his conscience and with his past. Directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. Good luck. Donatas Banyonis. Vladislav Dvorjetsky. Natalia Bondarchuk. Play the leading roles in Solaris. Uh, we have talked about Stalker in the past. I, I think Solaris is a, is a fascinating film. It's his, um, you know, kind of sci-fi space epic. Um, actually, when I was going to the movie, I got a text from some friends right before I was leaving that were like, hey, we're going to the UT baseball game. You want to join? And I was like, oh, I wish I could, but like, I'm going to see Solaris. And they're like, what? what? Why would you do that? Go, no, come to the baseball game. And then I met up with them afterward and uh, was talking with them. And they're like, so you went to see a George Clooney movie? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, the yeah. Movie. No, <laughs> uh, I went to see the original Russian masterpiece from 1972. And they were like, oh, that sounds dumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, Solaris is a movie that was made in Russia kind of in response to 2001 A Space Odyssey. And uh, it's based on a uh, Polish book, I believe, um, of that title. 
um, but made you know very much with Tarkovsky's um, ideas in mind. Like he saw 2001, thought it was very interesting visually, but didn't really like the message behind it of kind of um, you know technology furthering mankind and potentially leading to some sort of salvation or or evolution. And he kind of had a negative view of technology and made Solaris uh, as more of kind of questioning human advancement and exploring um, into space. Um, it's a long movie. It's two hours and 47 minutes, and it's very slow. If you've seen a Tarkovsky film, you kind of you have to get on his wavelength when you watch the movie, kind of slow your heart rate down a little bit and just kind of be willing to let him take you where he will. Um, he's famous for doing a lot of long shots and just very kind of pensive filmmaking style. Um, the movie looks great. Um, it's, it starts out on Earth. Um, there is a space station called Solaris that is investigating another planet. And the crew members have uh, potentially gone insane. There is one guy who has come back from the ship and said that he has seen all this crazy shit and nobody believes him. And they're sending the lead character, who is this psychologist, up to the space station to investigate and see what's going on. When he arrives there, only two people are remaining on the space station. One person has just committed suicide, and he is kind of trying to figure out what's happening. The first guy he meets says, hey, um, just so you know, there are only two of us here, plus you. If you see anything else, just like, be cool. Just, you know, don't lose your shit. And uh, then the lead character begins to encounter other people on this space station that are not these two scientists. And um, the film gets to a lot of fascinating ideas from there. And I think there's a lot of different things you can take away from uh, Solaris. The, the planet that they're visiting has this massive ocean that they are hovering over and they, they say the ocean is this kind of, it's a brain in and of itself, and they're trying to figure out how to communicate with it. And they believe they're receiving messages from the ocean. They're trying to communicate back, and some scientists are like, we got to shoot radiation at it and like, try to blow it up, or you know, we need to leave entirely, or um, you know, different kind of approaches to what they want to do and, and what it means to actually learn more about this planet. Do, you know, do they want to conquer it or try to learn to live with it, or should they leave? Um, and I think the film is just just pretty fascinating in ex its exploration of those ideas. Kind of my main takeaway from the movie, and I'm curious, I think, I know, John, you've seen it. I think, Ryan, you have as well. Yeah. But um, my main takeaway from the movie was, I thought it was an interesting kind of uh, message to live in the moment and not get too caught up in the past or the future. Um, you know, Tarkovsky seems to have a very negative view of advancement in technology and that that can't, like, really bring any satisfaction to humanity and like earth is the place where we need to be where, where life is. But also these characters get caught up in nostalgia in a really deep unsettling way that kind of prevents them from moving forward and, and to like living happy lives in the present. And so that was kind of my takeaway from it was like, you know, we need to be in the present experience the now and be happy with where we are, not be obsessed with, moving forward and and transcending our current state but also to kind of not get stuck um in the past but um yeah so i had a really good time with it you know it's just when you watch tarkovsky film there's not a lot of narrative you're just kind of with these characters experiencing these ideas looking at these beautiful images um and so yeah I, solaris is great uh, highly recommend anybody to go check it out yeah um, it makes sense that, you, that your takeaway would be to live in the moment because Tarkovsky has, I think, an interview where he's just laying in the bow of a tree, just <laughs> a, expounding like that you should, people don't, all the kids like in the modern day just rush too much and need to slow down and just breathe. And then all this other, you sense. look at all of his other movies and they all have that kind of slow methodical pacing to draw you in and like hypnotize you. Um, so it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, but yeah, from what I remember seeing this movie, it was very much like reminded me of um, it's like a good version of Michael Crichton's sphere uh, where like people just start seeing like manifestations of things from their subconscious. Um, and in that movie, it's just like schlock and there's a bunch of terrible shit that happens to a crew. I think Sam Jackson's that movie. If I can't, I can't remember. Um, yeah. no, he's not. I'm thinking right. of deep blue sea. Sorry. I was going to say, does he get eaten uh, by a shark? <laughs> yeah, he gets shark? eaten by a sphere. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but I just remember in this one, like, uh, people seeing, like, dead loved ones and um, starting to change their behavior because they see their dead loved ones and believe that they're back. And it, like, really impacts mm-hmm. their rationale and how they can think in the moment in the in the ship and what they do. And it, it impacts how they actually uh, uh, interact with real, like, corporeal people that are there. Um, and And that's pretty much all I remember. I also remember being very unnerved for most of it trying to figure out what's real and what's not and getting sucked into that kind of delusion along with the characters. So it really draws you in from that angle where like, yeah, people just come out of nowhere and they're talking about something and you're trying to keep up with what they're talking about. And then suddenly you're like on a farm or something and it's it's like, what the fuck's happening here? And, <laughs> um, just, it moves at such, it moves slow, but at the same time can like whip you into disorientation really fast. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I have seen it, and I've also seen the George Clooney one, which doesn't understand the source material or the previous movie. <laughs> I, I haven't problem. seen the George Clooney one, but I have no um, desire to. I assume if you see the trailer, you know enough. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, I really like the original, the author who wrote Solaris originally, Stan Saw Lim. Uh, it's hard to find science fiction that isn't, English science fiction originally, and even a lot of Lim's material, I have no way to read because it's only in Polish. Oh, wow. um, but if a few of his things have come over, and particularly the things post Soviet Union, uh, where he kind of got to he got to be a little bit more freewheeling in, in what he was talking about. I think he got into some really interesting ideas. It, I will say, for the movie again, it's different from the source material. It is much more an artistic piece. In the same way with Stalker, I feel like Roadside Picnic doesn't make a movie. It's too hard to make it as a movie and have it like visually give you the same feeling. But Stalker mm-hmm. does a good job of giving you the same feelings without being the same thing. And Solaris, like it, it, you're, you're, it's so much from the character's mind and their loss of the reality and the fact that you're like on a sentient ocean planet, which is a crazy idea. Mm-hmm. Um, that it again doesn't. I don't think it like works if you just try to one to one it. So again, I like that Tartoski takes his own like his own way with it. It's different. I think he's trying to tell a different point. Um, from necessarily what the the book was telling because I do think that he again like glosses through whatever he's at and is like, all right, this seems cool. Now I'm gonna go make my own thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> he Yodorowsky, which honestly, it. like, yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say like 2001: A Space Odyssey is also kind of like that, yeah, like yeah. you know. So you kind of uh, have to it, to some not... degree, and I, and I know Lem didn't like the movie. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Because I I think Lem's main point was that it's one. I like the interesting idea, and this is in that you know this is in the Solaris movie as well. Of like, we think extraterrestrials are going to be some other human that's green. Right. right. Uh-huh. Like that's our idea. But to be like, oh, it's a an ocean that can think. And then I'm like, but how can I talk to it? How can it talk mm-hmm. to me? Like that mm-hmm. kind of question is really interesting. Uh, and then the idea, at least in the book, the idea is like, oh, we can't even get past ourselves to actually even potentially have that conversation. Even if it tries to, we're so caught up on us that we only give reflections of ourselves to each oh, other when we talk right so it's this really like yeah. humanity doesn't even deserve to explore outside because we're so obsessed with what man is or what man could be mm-hmm. <laughs> um and in the movie is kind of I, yeah i agree i think it's a it's a bit different thought process but it's it's good like a tartoski's like i don't know you, you definitely have to sit in it right mm-hmm. <laughs> like any of his yeah it's not just sitting yeah it's not something you're going in and it's like hey here's the plot you're just in it yeah, yeah. it's like filling a jacuzzi with film <laughs> just soak right in <laughs> john john's done that yeah. before <laughs> it's a good time <laughs> but the uh no the george clooney one tries to get like a to be a romance story oh, like, no, it's, it's more on like yeah his wife and the dead wife and the, the prequel to gravity her and, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, Tarkovsky is like, I think, just objectively one of the most talented filmmakers that I've, I've ever seen. Like, just from a technical standpoint, his movies are just impeccable. And then they create these really intense atmospheres where, like, he doesn't have a lot of dialogue in his movies. There's not a lot of plot, but he's just kind of creating a vibe and a, an environment for you to explore some really interesting ideas. And I think that's just a, a really cool way to, to make movies. Um, 
another another thing the set design is fucking cool like the the space station cost them a bunch of money to make but like rather than trying to do a 2001 like state-of-the-art looking thing they wanted to make it look like a broken down bus <laughs> and <laughs> yeah it's like you know there's wires sticking out of the walls and things are fraying and sparks are coming out and it's a space station that has been run down where you know people have been there trying to make sense of this extraterrestrial life and they haven't been able to and they've given up and they've gone crazy and killed themselves or come home and you know it's like barely hanging on and this committee is trying to figure out you know do we want to decommission this entirely or is it worth like revamping this whole thing um and then the the ending of the movie i think is so powerful and is just just opens up all these different ideas and that was kind of my takeaway from it is is you know kind of not getting caught up in nostalgia and, and memories and you know kind of trying to move forward with your life but you know maybe not maybe not too far you know not not pursuing technology to a crazy degree but um you know i think there are a lot of different ideas that you can pull from it and it's kind of a it's a misdirect ending that i think is is really cool when it reveals what's actually going on yeah I mean, it's like a lot of Tarkovsky does that. I love that his movies have sort of an ambiguity to the end where it really does just raise discussion with everybody else. Like you can just talk with whoever we watched it with and probably talk for quite a long time about it and debate. Um, yeah. And that's, I don't know, it's benefit of his vibes. So for sure. Cool. Uh, so would recommend Solaris. Very nice. Very nice. Um, all right. Well, I've got a refute for y'all. Uh, all right. About Ryan, time. Ryan wanted one. I brought one. <laughs> um, <laughs> this refute was, uh, actually it's been released like three different times in three different markets and has three different names if you ever look it up. But the original title is, uh, Champagne and Bullets. Welcome to the biggest little movie ever made. Action, suspense, a thrill a minute, romance, and some very funny moments. We get some dope, we get a one. <laughs> You just made a big mistake. See, Sam? You see this? White powder. How about tolerating the goddamn justice system? Sit down! Dust that gun. I now pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> Get in the pool, man. Look. This court is now in session. You're smuggling drugs when you're a cop. Satan has guided us. Hey there, Dove Lugger. Promise I'll get you the high and mighty judge. He's the one who murdered the baby. What? Which was later uh, rebranded to Get Even, but it's like pushed together. There's no space, so it's Get Even. Um, <laughs> there's also, I think, Road to Revenge is the other name. Uh, and no matter what, you look up whatever the, the cover is, and it's going to look like awful, like 90s uh, bootleg cover of terrible Photoshop. Um, this is a vision of somebody who wanted to be in their own movie and be the star of it. Uh, this is John D Hart. That's the name of the writer director star. He's a triple threat. He also is, he's actually a quadruple threat cause he did the score and some oh of his my. own music for it. He has his own little music video in the middle. I swell up as you take me for a ride. Come on, pretty baby. Let's do the shimmy slide. The regular John Carpenter. Yep. He scored his own romance scenes as well. Um, this stars uh, Wings Hauser, who's a, a genre actor. If anybody has ever seen Wings Hauser in, in a movie, this is the movie that I recommend you see with Wings Hauser. I know I'm refuting it, but Wings Hauser's drunk for the entirety of this film and yeah. gets progressively more drunk as it goes on. There's no life circumstance that our savior can't help you with. Okay, so uh, could you ask our savior to uh, help me out with the rent? And uh, child support and utilities. And while you're at it, I'd like to ask him about reinstating me into my new job as a policeman, okay? Um, and it's also got Pamela Jean Bryant, who I believe is Miss March of 1978. Hey. Um, the basic premise of this movie is that uh, John DeHart's character um, is a cop who is betrayed by his commanding officer, who sends him and Wings Hauser into a raid and then frames them for stealing drugs. And that's because his commanding officer is a Satanist who sacrifices babies under the blood sure, moon. Sure. Okay. Um, and, uh, Pamela Jean is, uh, his love interest who 
uh, escaped this Satanist cult um, right before they sacrificed a baby. So, you know, she's still pure. She didn't join them. Um, and the whole movie is about John DeHart stroking his ego. Uh, that's basically the entirety of it. Of course, he's trying to take down his commanding officer, I guess, even though he's not on the force anymore, he becomes, um, just a vigilante and we just watched dirty Harry. So, Hey, very fitting. We bring up a, another <laughs> movie about going above the law to, to get revenge and justice. Um, probably the best parts of this movie are, uh, trying to understand what the fuck is even going on <laughs> with the plot because it ambles. Uh, I listened to, I have a Blu-ray of it. Um, despite refuting it, I own it. And John DeHart Very surprised gave a, a 25 minute audio interview where it was just like bullshit. Uh, it was amazing to hear him speak from the level of delusion he was speaking from. And uh, I knew going into this, he um, used to be a lawyer. And so I thought, oh, he made all his money. And then he made this movie using that money, right? Like you fulfill your fantasy of being an actor after you've made all your riches. Apparently he made this movie like three weeks before passing the bar and becoming a lawyer for 25 years. Yeah. So, uh, I, <laughs> I was really surprised to hear that. Um, and his justification was he used to be in a lot of Shakespearean productions and they would always make him like not a character. Like they'd make him the tree in the background or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> and he got pissed off and decided I'm going to make my own movie and I'm going to show you how good of an actor I can be a very Wizzo thing to do. Um, and he hired all the big talent, no Mickey Mouse stuff. Uh, and so when he got <laughs> Wings Hauser in his interview, he was like, yeah, Wings is just a total pro. You know, he uh, he didn't even really read my script. He just read the character and understood who it was. And I was like, this man thinks that Wings Hauser understood the character he wrote. Wings Hauser understood Jack Daniels, the character yeah. <laughs> um, and, and embodied that uh, it's. It's is just, is Wings his legal name? I don't know, but I hope it is. It's kind of <laughs> fucking rad. Did um, his mother name him that? <laughs> uh, I, I will say, um, in most scenes, Wings Hauser clearly is improvising, and he's not doing too much effort to do so. Um, there's a sequence. Let me just, I'll set the stage real quick and let y'all know out there. Here's what the tone feels like in certain scenes, and it's got a heavy whiplash to it. Um, Wings Hauser is in an abusive relationship with his wife. He's the abuser, I guess. And she left home, but we're supposed to feel sorry for him because she wants alimony. Uh, so he starts like a cult of Huckleberry Finn and then gets arrested for living like an anarchist lifestyle. <laughs> and when he's in jail, he drinks bleach. Hey, hey, what are you doing? in a very dramatic scene where he retches on the floor, writhing, dying. Oh my God. Then it just hard cuts. Did it kill to... his COVID though? <laughs> is COVID-19? Did it work? I think so because he wakes up in a hospital without a respirator. So oh, okay. he seems to have recovered. All right. Um, and John D. Hart comes to visit him in the hospital and he just casually goes, Hey buddy. How are you? I'm doing really good. How's it going? And he's like, it's going good because he's drunk. And uh, then John DeHart's like, I heard you did that bleach thing. What? You did that bleach thing. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie just moves on. <laughs> so it doesn't even take a suicide attempt to heart. It just takes it off like a, you rascal, you try to kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like a, you, you crazy son of a bitch. Um, Doing that bleach thing again. There are so many sequences where John DeHart tries to look like a badass, but he looks like Jeff Foxworthy with stage fright. Uh, yeah. And it, it just, <laughs> honestly, it makes those sequences way better, but it doesn't stop the pain of the movie overall. Uh, there's a sex scene that he has with Miss March of 1978 um, that lasts for like 10 minutes, it feels, in what looks like a bathtub in a Long John Silver's bathroom. Wait, I, I'm sorry. What? There's a bathtub at Long John Silver's? Uh, it, it's what it looks like because they have like fishing nets on all the walls, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> like weighted down buoys for whatever reason. Oh my god! Uh, and John DeHart's own music, love music, is playing, and he's singing in the background. What if it's a bathroom in that bar from <laughs> Mr. No Legs? It could easily be that. Oh, it yeah, looks right. like that. Yeah. There's like a a, <laughs> a mates and bitches bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But yeah, the entire time he just looks like a plank of wood who doesn't know what he's doing in a sex scene. And that's every That's why other they cast scene. him as trees. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. He was perfect as trees. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a gang member name. Hey, trees. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to make like a leaf and get out of here. <laughs> trees and wings. <laughs> trees and wings. Stay tuned for the buddy cop spinoff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the movie goes exactly where you think it would. It's a self-glorification trip, and it's one of those where, like, yeah, it's like if you're going to watch a bad movie with friends, this is one that's going to perplex you. I tried watching it with some of my friends, and none of us were really happy watching it. Even making fun of parts of it, you couldn't get over the uncomfortable sex scenes and the fact that John DeHart wanted you to hear, like, all of his greatest hits and everything that you saw. He sings in a bar, and everybody starts clapping for him, and it's just not good. No. Um. So yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely uh, refute this movie. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have anything else to add for that. Why <laughs> is he, it called he... Champagne and Bullets? It's part of his song that plays at the beginning. And I think it's because John DeHart in his head has this image of himself as a badass who drinks champagne and shoots bullets at the bad guys. Like, I don't know why it couldn't be, you know, like whiskey and bullets or something else. but. He's just celebrating that he's a badass, I guess. Yeah, popping bottles. Yeah, yeah. He's also like, I can't remember how old he's in this, but he looks like he's 60. And then he has like 25 yeah. years of career left after this yeah. in the law. Um, so does it's he, kind of does he look like uh, Jeff Foxworthy or does he look like what's a uh, dingle from Reno 911? Oh, the... like, yeah. Does he have the short shorts? He, yeah, yeah. He almost. Well. No, yeah, he might as well. Yeah. Doesn't he, doesn't he look like Jeff Foxworthy? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what, image. I, I <laughs> definitely see both of those comparisons that you guys made. Yeah. Yeah, the spitting image of, a, of Jeff Foxworthy flayed alive and somebody wearing his skin. <laughs> he has the kind of mustache that you're just like, oh God, that guy's committed some sex crimes. <laughs> yeah, like, something. Yeah. Allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty sure. No. <laughs> that's not like a Burt Reynolds or a Tom Selleck mustache. That's a that's a pedo mustache right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, champagne and bullets. Um, the champagne's got bad, and uh, the bullets. It's it's not even the cool kind of bullets. These are like BBs or some shit. It's it's pretty weak. <laughs> Ryan, have you seen this? Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> well, I was just yeah, waiting. I'm like, I was like, surely you watched this with John, didn't you? No, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think we watched it together though. No, so. you uh, found it on YouTube, didn't you? Yeah, I've just watched. <laughs> There's uh, so many of these really, really bad things like this that get up, uploaded to YouTube. This suburban Sasquatch. Um, yeah, no, I agree. This is like it, it's hard, right? That line of like good and bad and yeah. like watchable. Like this one's at that like. There's definitely. There are moments. Moments, yeah. The, the whole like judge is a cult the whole thing with the cult and all that is so over the top that like yep. that that's kind of becomes funny but then you have to sit through like uncomfortable scenes of this guy thinking he's badass there's um, a whole which scene somehow where takes miss march out on a date and reads her shakespeare from memory and you just sit there and yes, listen to him yeah. quote hamlet and that's like the scene <laughs> oh it's, weird it's not good and she's like <laughs> yeah she's such a great actress too she's so totally into it Honestly, she has the like, best work in this movie. She's, she's really trying. It's true. She is probably the best of everything that's in it. Yeah. Wait, it he's quoting like Hamlet. That. Is he doing like a suicide monologue at her at, at, on this date? <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take up arms against a sea of trouble by opposing in them. Doing to, to be, be or not, not to, yeah, be, to yeah. be or not to be. That's exactly wow, what he did. Wow. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It just never hits that. Like, some, there's something about the room that it it feels like there's supposed to be a joke in the room that you're not getting, and so you're intrigued. This <laughs> one falls into that. Okay, clearly this guy's just making a movie. <laughs> yes. Right. Like you just you know like okay he he thinks he's way cooler than he is. Where with the room you're like, does he think he's way cooler or not or what? Like there's there's that confused expression on your face that makes that work so well this is one of those where it's sort of like all right <laughs> yeah i think the it is an earnest though which i think is something about good bad movies that this one is an earnest movie yes <laughs> you need that element of innocence to yeah. make the movie somewhat fun where it is otherwise it's it's hollow yeah I, I would say go watch the room 
uh, or, you know, even it would Jim Cotta. That's, that's obviously one you've been recommending Dixon. Yes. I can't believe you still haven't watched Jim Cotta. Still haven't watched it. Uh, yeah, I'm working my way. (laughs) <laughs> don't worry about it next sl- schlocktober you have to program jim Cotta, i need it'll, it'll be on there yeah. don't worry okay i'll fix i'll cook we, the books <laughs> we should have a discussion john of the like the underneath the room like where you really like oh, when you pull back that you layer and you start going <laughs> yes because there, there's like bad like the room is a bad movie because it functionally is a movie and the plot makes sense it's just that the characters don't fit what's going on and the actors don't fit what's going on. But yeah. there's a hole underneath that rug of movies that functionally don't pull that off or aren't even movies. Like yeah. it's hard to even figure out what's going on because they forget who the main characters are even are far way through. Like we should talk about some of those where it's just yeah. like, I don't even think they understand what a movie is. It's oh, so yeah. weird. <laughs> I'm I'm down to to do that at some point. That seems like it'd be pretty fun. Obviously, that's right up my alley. So, <laughs> does Champagne and Bullets fall into that category? It falls into the not quite functionally a movie. Like it's a little like the the it's like plot s- and some of five falls apart. movies in one because it just has yeah. like several yeah. different plots going on about like why would we care about Wingshauser starting a Huckleberry Finn cult? It, it doesn't make any. He like slowly over time acquires like a straw hat and ripped pants and like the whole Huck Finn look. And it it's never explained. He's just drunk in those scenes. And for whatever reason, John DeHart just lets him go and uh, it forms its own sort of narrative thread. Okay. So yeah, um, uh, this movie has so many scenes where you could yell cut and it would be perfectly fine to yell it as early as possible. <laughs> Is it whenever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> whenever you guys feel like stopping, you know, just. <laughs> uh, just tuck yourselves out, I guess. <laughs> just use all this footage for whatever. Um, yeah. The only other thing I wanted to mention about this is I said it was released three different times. And that's because John DeHart, after he released it the first time, realized there's more money when you try to do overseas international pictures. So he would re-edit it for Chinese audiences. Um, and he cut out a bunch of blood and violence to re-release it. And it actually fixes a lot of the pacing issues. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and it makes it way more bearable to watch. But uh, the one that I've seen is the true Champagne and Bullets full director's vision. Does your Blu-ray have both cuts? It has all three of the cuts. It has Get Even, it has Road to Revenge, and it has Champagne and Bullets. And then it has a commentary and audio interview with John DeHart. So. It amazes me the lengths that Vinegar Syndrome will go to for these piles of shit movies. <laughs> Just shocking to me. It's purely out of respect for the artist, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so there you go, everybody. That's another refute on our, our Recommender Refute series. I hope everybody's happy. We got happy. one. We got him, everybody. <laughs> got it. Yeah. Uh, it, it the other fun fact was this was actually the movie I was supposed to talk about instead of Roller Babies. I couldn't remember that I watched this movie because... Every time I watch it, I repress it, mm. um, which apparently says something about roller babies, I guess. Babies, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, they're both refutes, folks. I think don't. it says something about you, mostly, John. <laughs> yeah. That I'd watch uh, roller babies and not remember the sex scene in a long John Silvers. <laughs> 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 Anyways, we closing things out here. We have a recommend from Ryan for Lay Misty for me. We have a recommend from Dixon. That is for Solaris, the that is. Tarkovsky film that I did not have the energy to muster to see. <laughs> but I do want to watch it again when you talked about it. Now I'm like, ah, shit, I got to go back and watch this um, along with a bunch of other Tarkovsky. I always get started on that cycle. Yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, a refute from me for Champagne and Bullets, Get Even, Road to Revenge, whatever John DeHart decides to republish <laughs> it as again, if he does. <laughs> Uh, d- don't watch it. The fourth um, cut comes out summer 2024. <laughs> it's not it's the always fun, a good, good sign. <laughs> it's always a good sign when it has multiple names. You like, mean yeah. like that's Black good, Easter and Assassin good. 33 yeah. AD, yeah. right? <laughs> and what were all the Mr. No Legs and what were the other ones oh, for God, that? Oh, God, Mr. No Legs yeah. have like 10, 10 names. Like 10 different names, yeah. I, Mr. No Legs is the best one. That's so the only sad. one I remember. It's yeah. a shame. It's just like how we found out that Wolfgang Schmitz isn't the director's real name. <laughs> it's really movie. his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah, there you go, folks. Um, signing off from Afterthoughts. It's uh, your host, John Garcia, and uh, with me as always, Ryan King. How much could a banana cost? $10? <laughs> 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 
you've clearly never set foot in a supermarket. <laughs> and? Michael Dixon, thanks for putting up with our bullshit. Hey there, movie buffs, TV toughs, and all listeners in between. John here from the Afterthoughts Podcast. I just wanted to drop in at the end of this episode and say thanks for listening. If you've got afterthoughts of your own to share, hit us up. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Afterpod, or jump into a conversation on our Discord server. You can find info for this and more at theafterpod.transistor.fm. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode.